It's my pleasure to introduce Commissioner Ostendorf. Uh, he served on a commission since April of 2010 and is approaching four de decades of dedicated public service. Before coming to the NRC, Commissioner Ostendorf served as the Principal Deputy Administrator for the Department of Energy's National uh, Nuclear Security Administration, as well as holding senior positions at the National Academies and the House Armed Services Committee staff. This was preceded by a distinguished 26-year naval career where he notably held command of a nuclear attack submarine as well as a submarine squadron. <clears throat> Excuse me. Commissioner? Well, good morning. I agree with Brian that Commissioner Svinicky is a tough act to follow. Uh, I'm not going to try to do that. It's interesting, uh, Bill Magwood, uh, for the last four years, I spoke after him, and usually he had the podium way up here at this level, and so it's Commissioner Svinicky and I are about the same height, so it's good to have a, a compatible uh, podium precede me. So it's a great opportunity to be here today. Thanks for the privilege of speaking to this distinguished group of colleagues from the nuclear safety community. I particularly want to welcome our international colleagues. We really value our relationship with you across the board. Before I begin, I have a few notes of appreciation. First, I want to thank the NRC staff, Bill Dean, Brian Sheeran, their staffs who work so hard every year to prepare for the RIC. I'd also like to thank fellow commissioner colleagues here in the front row, for Chairman Burns, Commissioner Barron. Welcome to your first, Rick, in your new roles. I've been impressed with how smoothly you and your staffs have transitioned to new, new responsibilities. To Commissioner Svenicky, thank you for continuing to be a close colleague and dear friend these past five years on the commission. To the NRC staff, a heartfelt thanks to you for your high caliber of work and your dedication to the NRC's mission. It is a true privilege to work alongside you. And two final personal notes of thanks. First, a former member of my staff, John Tappert. John left my office last year after two years as my chief of staff. He is now serving as the director of division of engineering in the Office of New Reactors. I could not have asked for a more high-performing professional and collegial individual. I am most grateful, John, for your hard work and service to the NRC. Thank you. And second, to Jim Wiggins. Jim's down here in the front row, back three, three chairs, the director of the Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response. Jim will be leaving the NRC after 35 years of dedicated service, following six years as a nuclear submarine officer. I know that we are all indebted to Jim for his commitment to common sense, pragmatic regulation. I've learned a lot from Jim. And I thank you, Jim, for your leadership, service, and friendship. <laughs> Commissioner Spinnecke has been here for seven ricks. This is my fifth. Uh, it's kind of like Thanksgiving at the kitty table. Last year, for the last four years, I've been on day two. Jeff, don't take any offense about it. Uh, so this is my first time to, to, quote, sit and talk with the big boys and girls. Since last year, we've seen some significant changes, uh, new commissioners arriving, dear friends and colleagues leaving, George Apostolakis, Bill Magwood, Allison McFarland. But as you know, change is not new to the NRC. We've handled changes in the past, as Chairman Burns noted, with Three Mile Island, 9-11, Fukushima, and various reorganizations, as well as changes in the economics of the nuclear industry. And changes will continue into the future as our agency will face new technical issues and will no doubt adopt new and better ways of doing business. But throughout these changes, the NRC remains committed to the principles of good regulation. These principles are the bedrock upon which we build our regulatory framework. I find that periodic assessments of how we are doing as a regulator to be a constructive exercise, especially reflecting upon how we live up to our principles of good regulation. Last year I talked about independence and openness as well as the importance of our highly valued technical staff. Today I'll focus consistent with the project aim theme of the chairman and of Mark Sartorius and Commissioner Svenke, I'll talk about the principle of good regulation associated with efficiency. 
and I will focus on the NRC as a team in my remarks. The principle of efficiency has the following attributes. It provides that the NRC should have the best management and administration. It requires the highest technical and managerial competence. It values the ability to continually upgrade our regulatory capabilities. And it holds that regulatory activities should be consistent with the degree of risk reduction achieved. And finally, efficiency emphasizes timely decision making while minimizing the use of resources. Why should a commissioner talk about efficiency? The short answer is very simple. Because making efficiency real is essential to being an effective regulator. The principle of efficiency was at the forefront of the Commission's mind when it charted the project aim effort last year to determine how best to enhance the agency's ability to plan and execute its mission while adapting to a dynamic environment. You may wonder, why did the NRC need to change at this time? It is not because we were doing things wrong or are doing things wrong. As Chairman Burns noted for 40 years, the NRC has met its safety, security, and safeguards mission and has met or surpassed agency performance measures in large part. But it is not enough to accomplish the mission or meet internal metrics. We owe it to the public to be as effective, efficient, agile, and flexible as possible so as to provide the best value for the dollars spent on our budget. While we will never be perfect in this regard, we acknowledge that there is ample room for improvement in these areas. The Project AIM report points out that we have given, excuse me, that we have grown over the years to respond to a number of events. For example, following the terrorist attacks of 2001, I was an active duty in the Navy then, the agency grew to enhance security and incident response. The agency also grew after the Energy Policy Act of 2005 in response to a forecast of a nuclear renaissance. In 2011, we faced difficult and complex decisions about what regulatory actions were needed in response to the Fukushima event. In the NRC's committed professional efforts taken in response to each of these events, the orders and rulemakings that came out of 9-11 and Fukushima, and the work we've done in the new reactor arena have clearly illustrated the high quality work of this agency and its staff. But now is an inflection point in our agency's history and an opportunity to thoughtfully reflect upon where we have been and where we need to be in the future. To ask, how are we conducting our work? To ask, what adjustments, if any, need to be made to our structure, workforce, and regulatory processes, given that the nuclear renaissance has not occurred as forecasted, that 9-11 and Fukushima-related activities are drawing to a close, and that several existing nuclear power plants are decommissioning earlier than expected. These elements are the backdrop for Project AIM, which I believe is a real opportunity for us to take a fresh look at how we operate and see where we can gain efficiencies. I applaud Mike Weber's team for producing an insightful strategic report. I'll also observe that not many organizations get this kind of an opportunity. And of those that do, fewer still actually take advantage of them. I am actually, as a commissioner, excited and have great hope that this agency will take advantage of this opportunity and be guided by the principles of good regulation to move forward constructively. Now, some of you may be wondering, can a government agency really be efficient? So now I'll tell my one joke. Once upon a time, the government had a vast scrapyard in the middle of a desert. The government said, someone may steal from it at night. So government created a night watchman position and hired a person for the job. Then government said, how does the watchman do his job without instruction? So they created a planning department and hired two people, one person to write the instructions and one person to conduct time studies. Then government said, 
how will we know the night watchman is doing the task correctly? So they created a quality control department and hired two people, one to do the studies and one to write the reports. Then government said, how are these people going to get paid? So they created the following positions, a timekeeper and a payroll officer, then hired two people to fill them. Then government said, who will be accountable for all of these people? So they created an administrative section and hired three people, an administrative officer, assistant administrative officer, and a legal secretary. Then government said, we've had this command and operation for one year. We are now $18,000 over budget. We must cut back overall cost. So they laid off the night watchman. <laughs> Not quite the response Commissioner Spinnecke got. <laughs> but you get the point. Government efficiency in action. Fortunately, this type of behavior in the joke, in all seriousness, is not what I saw in my years at the Department of Defense, nor at the Department of Energy. It is certainly not what I've seen in my time the last five years at the NRC. Rest assured, no matter how the Commission votes on the project name recommendations, this agency will continue to improve on its already strong performance. Why am I so, why am I so confident about this? because I've seen the great work of this agency and its talented staff, especially when we have an eye towards efficient operations. For my service on six submarines, I can attest to the value in having positive, real, tangible models to follow when teaching others, whether training a new ensign, how to direct propulsion plant casualty actions by his watch section, whether conducting a smart landing on a single propeller submarine conducting a landing alongside a pier without a tugboat, or how to effectively conduct a submerged attack with a torpedo against a quiet adversary. Seeing others do something well is almost always a good starting point for teaching and actualizing change for the better. And fortunately, the NRC has a number of positive models to offer to help us improve efficiency. The Project Name Report categorizes recommendations into three strategic categories, people, planning, and process. For symmetry, I will use these same categories to discuss examples of efficiency in action at the NRC. These examples show that when we start with the end in mind, establish clear direction and priorities, and are flexible to change, we do regulate in an efficient, and effective manner. The first example of a people strategy I'll point to is the agency's ability to reallocate resources in response to changing priorities and workload. Last fall, the Commission approved the staff's recommendation to merge the Office of Nuclear Materials Safety and Safeguards, NMSS, and the Office of Federal and State Materials and Environmental Management Programs, or FISME, back into one office. In making this recommendation, the staff recognized that the increased workload that drove the split of NMSS into two offices years ago no longer existed, and that there was some duplication in effort between the two offices. The merger back into one office gained efficiencies by eliminating unnecessary duplication and reducing overhead. I personally thank Kathy Haney and Brian Holian, along with their teams, for achieving this successful, efficient merger. Likewise, efficiencies were seen when the Office of New Reactors, or NRO, shifted personnel to the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, or NRR, given changes in its workflow and priorities over the past two years. When I was sworn in as a commissioner April 1st of 2010, the NRC was reviewing license applications for 26 new reactors. Since that time, we have completed several significant new reactor projects, including the AP1000 design certification amendment, the issuance of four combined licenses for the Vogel and Summer sites, work on the ABWR design certification amendment, and establishment of the construction reactor inspection program. But with this work completed, and with changing plans of prospective licensees, our new reactor workload has significantly decreased. At the same time, 
there is a need to address several high priority actions in NRR, including addressing the operator, operating reactor licensing backlog and post Fukushima activities. Therefore, in response, the staff moved resources from NRO to NRR to support these efforts, while not losing sight of ongoing new reactor priorities. For example, NRO and their partner offices achieved a significant milestone last year as part of the Safe Closure Initiative by completing the ESBWR design certification, as well as the final safety evaluation for the Fermi Unit 3 combined license. This is a good news story. I applaud Glenn Tracy and the NRO team for their agility and flexibility in responding to changing new reactor plans and schedules and for their support of broader agency priorities, including support of Fukushima and waste confidence activities. This staff has demonstrated that we can work together efficiently to make sure the most important work gets done first. I will now turn to the second project aim strategy, that of planning. How have we demonstrated the ability to efficiently plan our work? While there are many examples to choose from, I will offer only two here the update to our waste confidence or continued storage rule completed last August, and the completion of the last Yucca Mountain Safety Evaluation Report volumes in January of this year. In 2012, the D.C. Circuit Court vacated and remanded the agency's waste confidence rule. The Commission gave the staff clear direction, address the specific deficiencies identified by the Court, use the best NEPA practitioners in the agency, and bring back an updated rule to the Commission within 24 months. Keith McConnell and his very talented team, along with dedicated support from the Office of General Counsel, did just that. Throughout the process, the staff was committed to effective and timely communication, both with the public and with NRC management and the Commission. This helped ensure that schedules were met, Documents were responsive to concerns raised, and internal and external meetings were effective. At both an individual and agency level, we focused on the principle of efficiency to accomplish our important mission without undue delay. The second example of demonstrated planning ability is the staff's efforts on the Yucca Mountain Safety Evaluation Report. The staff was tasked by the Commission to complete and issue several volumes of the SCR associated with the Yucca Mountain construction authorization application. This was a monumental effort. Many of the staff with expertise on the safety evaluation report had left the agency or had been tasked with other assignments. There is a considerable amount of reorganizing, reprioritizing that went along with this effort to ensure that the right people with the right skills were on board to accomplish the mission. And of course, the Yucca Mountain Safety Evaluation Report involved highly technical and complex issues. The staff developed a plan of attack and executed that plan in such a way that the SCR volumes were completed on time and under budget, while the primary mission, reaching safety findings based on science and engineering, was achieved. I point out at this time that we must always remember the power of good leadership. Good leadership inspires people and creates its own efficiencies. The Yucca Mountain efforts show how important good management and leadership are to achieving efficiencies. Josie Pacone, head of the staff's efforts in completing the Yucca Mountain Safety Evaluation Report. Josie's clear dedication and tireless work ethic led by example and along with the hard work of talented staff resulted in efficient and effective regulatory action. I'll now turn to the third and final project aim strategy, process. In short, how can we streamline or standardize our processes, roles, and responsibilities? I offer two examples from the rulemaking arena, INSER cybersecurity rulemaking and the post-Fukushima mitigating strategies rulemaking. Now, some might wonder why I would mention our cybersecurity rulemaking as an example of efficiency, given that the NRC's rule 
That's 10 CFR 73.54, came out in 2009, and the NRC just endorsed revised guidance in December 2014. But it's important to remember that efficiency is not only about being fast. It is also about making risk-informed licensing decisions to help ensure the regulatory burden is actually commensurate with the risk. That's why I'm telling this story. In 2009, the NRC put in place cybersecurity requirements for power reactors. Nuclear power plant cyber programs required to protect what's called critical digital assets, or CDAs. In January 2010, the NRC published a reg guide, 5.71, that provided guidance to licensees on an acceptable way to meet the requirements of this rule. This reg guide contains guidance on how to identify CDAs, among other things. Now, as industry began implementing the rule, it became evident that there is much more work involved than originally envisioned by either the staff or industry. Instead of finding hundreds of CDAs, plants were identifying thousands of CDAs. The staff and I will personally commend Barry Westrick and Russ Feltz. The staff took a step back and worked with stakeholders to adjust the approach to focus on the most important CDAs. What resulted is a consequence-based approach, which is consistent with our efficiency principle, whereby regulatory activities should be consistent with the degree of risk reduction they achieve. The NRC staff engaged thoughtfully with industry to develop NEI 13-10 to implement the consequence-based approach. NEI 13-10 was endorsed by the NRC in January 2014. By streamlining the process for identifying and addressing CDAs, the approach reduces the burden on licensees while continuing to ensure that proper adequate protection standards are met. Revised guidance was endorsed by the NRC in December 2014. One final process example is in the area of post-Fukushima regulatory actions. The staff, led by Mike Johnson, in concert with industry, has consolidated thoughtfully many of the post-Fukushima requirements into one effort called the Mitigation of Beyond Design Basis Events Rulemaking. The scope of this rulemaking now includes near-term Task Force Recommendation 4 regarding station blackout mitigation, near-term Task Force Recommendation 7 regarding spent fuel pools, Recommendation 8 regarding on-site emergency response capabilities, and Recommendations 9, 10, and 11 regarding emergency preparedness. Consolidating these rulemakings will produce a more coherent framework and will certainly reduce the potential for inconsistencies between the related regulatory actions. Consolidation also adds clarity for external stakeholders as they will be able to con comment on a single rulemaking package. This consolidation was an efficient way to move forward given the number of interdependent and interrelated safety issues involved. Going forward, these efforts can be looked on as an example of how the NRC adapts to changes in stakeholder feedback and tailors its regulatory response accordingly while maintaining a risk-informed focus. I will now conclude. We, the NRC, and the Commission regulate in a field where not everyone is going to be happy with the decisions we make. Some might want us to do more. Some might want us to do less. And let's face it, some don't want us around at all. But we are here as a regulator fulfilling our statutory responsibilities. We owe it to the public we serve as well as the industry we regulate to come to our decisions in an efficient and effective manner. The good news is that we do not need any new agency values or different or new principles of regulation to guide us into the future. We already have them in place. We also are fortunate to have a number of positive examples of how to operate efficiently to guide the broader agency as we move forward to implement project AIM. I have great confidence that the NRC team is up to this task. I thank you for the chance to be with you today. I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions here. 
You ready for the first one? You bet. Okay. Um, as NRC implements AIM 2020, how will you prioritize work among the staff, national labs, the Southwest Research Institute, and commercial con contractors? That's a great question. It's interesting. The uh, Southwest Research Institute uh, team was just in here in the last week to visit commissioners for drop-ins. We've had a really good discussion with uh, that team from uh, San Antonio. Um, now, the commission is in the process of acting on the project aim recommendations. I'll comment on one of those recommendations that I think gets to this particular effort, actually two of them. One of them deals with a recommendation to re-baseline the agency's work, to step back and take a thoughtful review of what should we be doing, what work should we stop doing, what should we shed. Related to that is looking at what skill sets are needed to do this re-baseline work. That obviously involves looking at critical skills. There's a notion of centers of expertise in project aim that might look at an option of taking seismic experts, hydrologists, digital I and C engineers, and moving them into particular centers of expertise to serve as a miniature, I'm using this example, technical support agency or technical support office for all parts of the agency. Uh, how that comes out remains to be seen. I think part of that, Brian, is uh, looking at what we do internally, what we look at the Department of Energy and National Labs for, what we look for consultants, contractors, institutes, and so forth. So I think that those, uh, that question will be fully answered uh, once the Commission comes to its final decision on the direction forward, issues an SRM, and then turns over the staff to execute. Okay, thank you. Um, next one. Um, the agency has a trend of standing up large organizations and directorates in a reactive response to external drivers, for example, Japan lessons learned, waste confidence. This often results in an ad hoc redirection of a significant number of staff from ongoing activities to new work, which is often still being defined. Do you believe this is an appropriate way to respond or that the agency could handle these factors with less impact on day-to-day -day act activities? That's a very thoughtful question if we ever asked it. I would, I would uh, provide the following, and Commissioner Sveniki and I were here as commissioners for all the post-Fukushima decision-making and all the waste confidence uh, court remand decisions. So we've been involved in this as, as colleagues for some time. I would say with respect to Fukushima, given the nature of the event and the near-term task force work, that uh, it was appropriate at the time to stand up the JLD, Japan's Lessons Learned Directorate, to establish a separate body with a steering committee associated with that to work with the staff as well as with industry. Uh, but there's also a natural time to sunset that and move it back into the regular line work of the staff. And I think we're approaching that latter stage right now to move those bodies of work back into NRR. With respect to waste confidence, and I commented very uh, sincerely on the, the work done by Keith McConnell and his team, with a lot of help from others in the agency, I think given the Commission's desire to, to move forward and address the D.C. Circuit Court's remand in the spent fuel pool fires, spent fuel pool leaks, what happens if there's never a repository, and those very three specific issues, the agency was well served by a dedicated group of NEPA experts to go in there and take a hard look, do it in an efficient manner as their, their sole task, and then to back out of it, and that's what they've done. Okay, thank you. Um, next one. ENSER was formed post 9-11 to oversee needed improvements. Now, four years later, these regulations, uh, I'm sorry, no, 14 years later, uh, these regulations have been implemented for years. In the spirit of reducing unnecessary costs, is there some discussion of returning the ENSER function to the regions where it belongs uh, and was formerly located? Let me, address, let me address the specific question asked, and then I'll make a general comment on security issues. Uh, I'm not aware of any effort, I'm, I'm not aware as the Commission of any effort to uh, change the reporting relationship or of INSER and to move things back in the regions. I will say, as with any organization, when you uh, have an external event, 9-11 was one of those uh, for everybody in this room, 
that the agency takes actions they believe are appropriate at that point in time, and then you get into a need to reevaluate where security issues are and how are we handling these issues, whether it's physical security or cyber security. I would suggest that, and I wrote a comment on this with George Apostolakis back in 2013 to look at our force on force exercise program. To take a thoughtful look, I thought then in 2013, early 2014, it was the right time for this agency to take a fresh look at the FOF, Force on Force program, to see was it uh, meeting objectives, had it perhaps uh, in some areas maybe gone a little past what was originally intended. That's just one example, but I think overall that the project AIM effort does allow us to take a fresh look at NSER as, as well as other offices and we'll see what happens. But I'm not aware of any effort to uh, disestablish the office or move it back into the regions. Okay. Um, next one, this is interesting. As a submarine commander, uh, how would you have presented the mission objectives of a project, uh, of a program like Project AIM to your crew? What could the NRC learn from a sub-crew in ex ex execution? Wow. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a number of people in the audience here that also could answer that question. And I'm aware that my former boss, when I was prospective commanding officer instru instructor for the Atlantic Fleet, Joe Henry, flag officers in the audience today. So, uh, Joe, if I get this wrong, you can tell me afterwards. You know, the hardest job I had my entire life uh, when I was, I guess, 30 years old, I was engineering an old attack submarine, USS John Marshall. that just came out of an overhaul in Puget Sound shipyard to be converted from a ballistic missile submarine into a special warfare platform for Navy SEALs. And I relieved at the end of the overhaul and brought the ship around the Panama Canal to Norfolk, Virginia, where we were working with the SEALs based out of Little Creek. And I'll never forget every single machinist mate was in port and starboard watch rotation. They were standing 12 hours of watch a day, six hours on, six hours off, and then responding to different training drills in between their watches. And we were really short on people, and you know, qualified people. It took a long time to break out of that, it's called port and starboard, six on, six off routine. And that was really uh, a challenge for the crew. And we were operating, I thought, as efficiently as we could with the people we had. But it was hard. And so I take that experience and I say, well, how are we utilizing our people today? Sometimes one has to be willing to say there is work that no longer needs to be done. There's work that needs to be shed or deferred, not placed just a low priority where we say, we're not going to do this anymore. And I think we're perhaps at a juncture in our history where we need to do just that, say, we're no longer going to do X prime, Y prime, and Z prime will do X, Y, and Z. But we need to be willing to make some tough decisions as a commission and the senior leadership of the staff to do that. So that's what I uh, would, would say from my experience. Sometimes you can't do everything. You have to prioritize and do what's important. OK, thank you. Um, as part of AIM, two, uh, so, I'm sorry, as part of AIM 2020, does NRC intend to create, this is capability, I think it means like centers of excellence, uh, the cross-cut directorates, can you discuss? Certainly, that's, cert that's one of the uh, recommendations from the team, and I thought it was a very thoughtful recommendation to have, uh, consider standing up centers of expertise. Quite frankly, we've already done that in many areas, where Scott Flanders Group in NRO has provided uh, the hydrologist to look at the flooding hazard reevaluations for Fukushima. And so we have de facto been doing this for the last couple of years, I think, in a very thoughtful, practical way. And I think we'll leverage that experience from the hydrology side of the house, from seismic, perhaps PRA in the context of NFPA 805. Lots of good examples to, to call from. And we can say, hey, this has worked well doing it this way. This may not work as well. And we'll have the benefit of that experience. Okay. Okay. Here's a good philosophical one. Um, many people think of regulation uh, as, as a detriment to innovation. But innovation uh, in uh, certain technologies has the potential to improve safety. 
How does DNR think, or what does DNRC think about promoting innovation for safety purposes? Uh, is there a way uh, to change regulations so that it is uh, not a burden, but a welcome way to improve safety performance? Is that somebody's PhD dissertation topic? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a very thoughtful question. I, I just, I'll, one thing that comes to mind is uh, I think this agency sees attention at times. We, we all support innovation. We want to see new ways of doing business. At the same time, we have to fulfill our regulatory responsibilities. And I'd say the, the battleground in which this has been uh, more obvious to me as a commissioner has been in the introduction of digital INC technologies in the context of digital upgrades for existing nuclear power plants. And I think we've seen a lot of examples in that area where industry has some really good ideas, our staff wants to support it, but what level of pedigree is required, how do we look at assessing the reliability of certain types of processors. Um, so it, it's a lot easier said than done. I don't know that we have gotten there yet on digital I and C. Um, I know when my son came back from his first combat tour in Iraq and was telling me, uh, engaging with, with Al Qaeda, about the use of digital technology to call in close air support from F-18s and F-16s in, in Diyala province, it was, it was all digital. Communications, laser-guided weapons that had lethal consequences. People were dying every hour out there using digital technology. and so. Perhaps criticism of the broad nuclear enterprise as we've been maybe a little bit slow, a little bit uh, uh, reluctant to embrace digital technology, but it's here to stay. And so I think that's one area that we can continue to make progress in. And I know that that's an area we talk a lot to our international colleagues about. I know that in Office of Research you do just that uh, from your, your vantage point, Brian. Okay. And I think uh, we have time for about one more question. Okay. Um, this is on Yucca Mountain licensing. It says, uh, after the licensing board rejected DOE's request to withdraw the Yucca license application, has DOE notified NRC that the DOE will not support the NRC Yucca licensing process? I want to make sure I understand the question. I, here, here's what I think the question is. What is our current understanding of what the Department of Energy is doing or is not doing. I think as the Chairman indicated in his remarks, uh, the Department of Energy informed the NRC last year that DOE would not be performing the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement. And so the Commission uh, directed our staff to do that as part of our own NRC staff efforts. Uh, I can't speak to what the Department of Energy is willing to do or is actually going to do. I think the legal case is still in a state of suspension. There is still a legal applicant, maybe not a willing applicant. Uh, I think as far as what DOE plans to do, that's best addressed to DOE. Okay. Um, and I think that's all the questions okay. we had, and we're just about out of time. So I would like to thank you very much. Thank you all.